everyday injustice is really what we call the average problem that afflicts the system. There's a big problem in trying to hold people accountable in the criminal legal system. This allows the police and prosecution to get away with misconduct. And as a result, the public is unaware of the true nature of the system. At the Vanguard, we fight back against these everyday injustices by exposing them. We are a nonprofit news organization whose network of reporters and interns across the state monitor and report on criminal court proceedings. We highlight cases that deserve more attention, whether it be wrongful convictions or to demonstrate the inhumane treatment of those trapped in a truly unforgiving system. The Vanguard's investigative reporting has helped to uncover long-standing injustices and spark new interests in cases previously forgotten. Douglas Chief Stankiewicz stands as the longest serving person on death row in all of California, serving 43 years for a murder that evidence suggests that he could not have committed. Because of our independent reporting, new facts of the case have been brought to light and now a documentary on Chief's cases in production. On top of court watching and investigative reporting, the Vanguard follows injustice wherever it arises. Incarcerated people in the United States are among those who've been worst hit by COVID-19. In California, CDCR's system of 35 state prisons has been reporting COVID-19 statistics since March of 2020. California's county jails, however, have refused to do the same. Our project at the Davis Vanguard has been tracking COVID-19 statistics from six county jail systems, in particular, Alameda, Fresno, Sacramento, San Francisco, Santa Clara, and Yolo. We're also one of the collaborators with the UCLA Law COVID Behind Bars project. We are also a leading investigative body that has highlighted failures in public We have established several student-run publications, and our mission is to bring accountability through transparency and unbiased reporting of local, state, and national issues. Throughout our 15 years of work, the Vanguard has cultivated a vast network of collaborations with lawyers, district attorneys, and public defenders offices across California. And now we're working here in San Francisco to highlight the progressive movements of the newly elected DA. The Vanguard's Court Watch program is unique and necessary in the fight for a more progressive, reformed, and fair system. And you can help us win that fight. Your generous donation will help us to expand our network to more cities, hire more reporters, and get ourselves one step closer to our goal of having a reporter in every single courtroom in California. Together, we can bring honesty and transparency to your community. So please, donate today. Welcome everyone. I'm David Greenwald. I'm the founder and director of the Vanguard. And uh, we have for you tonight a great show. Welcome to the Big Day of Giving. First of all, I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out tonight, for donating. Uh, so many of you here tonight have also helped us. Uh, make everything possible. Um, so I want to thank everybody. But I especially want to thank our two special speakers for tonight, George Gascone, the Los Angeles District Attorney, and Brendan Woods, the Alameda uh, Public Defender, for taking time out of their very busy schedules uh, to help us and do what we do best, which is bring vital discussions to the community and to the justice reform movement. Here at the Vanguard, we started out as a single court watch in little Yolo County back in 2010, and we may have been one of the first court watches in the nation at that point. And we now have over 50 interns in courtrooms, mostly virtually these days, in places like Sacramento, Alameda, San Francisco, Contra Costa, Fresno, 
Orange, Riverside, and Los Angeles. I truly believe that one of the keys to reform is transparency and accountability, and our interns monitor and report on injustice every day. You can continue to help us by becoming a sustaining member at $10 a month by hitting the link that's been posted into the chat at any time during this evening. So now I'm going to introduce uh, briefly our two speakers for, for this evening. Uh, we have Brendan Woods, who is the public defender in Alameda County. Uh, welcome, Brendan. Uh, thank you for having me, David. Did you wanna introduce yourself uh, very briefly? Sure, yeah, so um, thank you for having me. My name is Brendan Woods. I am the public defender of Alameda County. I've been in this role since 2012. I've been a public defender since 1996. Um, some people may or may not know our office was formed in 1927. It's one of the oldest public defender offices in the nation. Uh, I was appointed in 2012. And at that point in time, I became the first person of color, the first black person to ever hold this position in Alameda County. Um, and I always say that when I'm talking, and it's kind of shocking when you think about it. You know, Alameda County, uh, Oakland, Berkeley, you know, home of the Black Panthers. And it wasn't until 2012 that a black person held this position. It's, it's shocking, shocking. And then one more shocking piece around that. Uh, currently in the entire state, the entire state of California, I'm the only black chief public defender. So when we talk about racial equity, racial injustice, about how people of color need to be in positions of power, um, that is a prime example of our shortcomings right there. So um, I've been a public defender for quite some time now. Uh, I love this job. I love what I do. And I'm just really happy to be here and thank you for allowing me to do this. And then we're very pleased to welcome George Gascon. Uh, it's really interesting because uh, we started our San Francisco Court Watch back in 2019. And uh, George Gascon was the DA in San Francisco. And then he got elected in LA and we just started a court watch in LA. So we're following you, George, around the state. Uh, but welcome here this evening. Thank you. Thank you, David. And good to see you, Brendan. Yeah, thank everyone. As uh, David indicated, I was the uh, uh, district attorney in San Francisco for almost nine years, uh, initially appointed then got elected twice and pretty much became a, a uh, very committed to reducing mass incarceration and and I used to talk about criminal justice reform and I move away from that term uh, because I came to the conclusion that actually the criminal justice system or the criminal legal system was doing what was doing exactly what it was assigned to do which was uh, put a lot of people in prison in jails especially black and brown people and I really came through my own evolution that the system really needed to be completely uh, re-engineered um, I am originally from LA. I grew up in LA. My family immigrated to, this, uh, to the US in the late 1960s. And I was coming back home. And when I announced that I was not running for re-election in San Francisco and going back home, uh, a lot of people started asking what I consider running uh, for the LA District Attorney's Office. And after working and uh, you know, trying to help our current District Attorney in San Francisco, Shay Sabudi, and get elected, um, I went to LA run and was elected and was elected in a very clear platform of uh, ending the use of the death penalty, which I know it may surprise some of you, but in LA County is uh, very prevalent. Uh, 23 people were sent to death row in the last seven years, about 250 people out of the 700 plus people on death row come from LA County, uh, ending the prosecution of uh, children as adults, which again, LA County led the way uh, with sending hundreds of kids to adult prison every year, um, looking to police accountability and ending the use of most uh, enhancements. I'm glad to say that in the first 100 days in office, uh, we have uh, just conservatively speaking, uh, reduced prison sentence by over 8,000 years. Uh, we stopped 77 kids from going to, adult, to the adult system and we stopped 17 cases, death penalty cases from proceeding down the death penalty track. Um, and, uh, you know, I look forward to the conversation today. Thank you. Um, so uh, we're going to uh, 
talk about uh, race and policing, which uh, it's really interesting when, when we devised uh, this program, um, of course, uh, the, uh, the trial for Derek Chauvin was underway, but we really had no idea how much bigger an issue uh, even uh, this was gonna become because it was before the death of uh, Dante Wright. Uh, before what's uh, taken place in Alameda County uh, with the uh, with the Mario Gonzalez case, uh, so it's become an even bigger issue. Um, so, can you, um, George, uh, discuss the state of policing in wake of uh, George Floyd's death and now the conviction of uh, Derek Chauvin? Yeah, look, uh, I think first of all, David, I think it's important. To for me uh, to say that uh, I, we have to be careful that we do not fall into a false sense of, you know, that something revolutionary just happened with a conviction of uh, Chauvin. Uh, I think this was a, a case uh, that, but for a young woman having the courage to video the entire episode, um, the jury would not have been given the opportunity. Uh, if you look at the official reports coming from the police department in the city prior to the trial, as they, the way they explain what occurred, uh, you know, very, uh, very clinically saying that this individual had a, a medical episode and he passed away at the hospital or en route to the hospital without ever mentioning the fact that he was murdered by a police officer. So. Uh, I think it's really important to first of all understand what happened. However, and this is where I do believe there is a difference. I think that the the way that the public reacted to this, beyond just simply the black and brown communities, but across many other communities for the first time uh, last year, I think it created a historical moment uh, that that we need to cease and we need to ensure that we don't lose the opportunity to really have uh, systemic change and systemic uh, restructuring. I think as you well pointed out, just, you know, just, you know, as we're going through this trial, we had the death of Dante Wright and, and others since then. So the problem continues to be there. I think that, you know, the way that we continue to uh, empower police uh, to use force, and the laws surrounding police use of force and the way that we use police departments needs to change. I think that there's a lot of work that is going on, uh, but I wanna make sure that we understand that uh, there is a lot of work that needs to be done. And I don't think we have a right by any stretch of the imagination. Well, it is interesting. And, and, and since you're now in LA, um, you know, my introduction uh, to uh, uh, police issues was, of course, the Rodney King case uh, when I was just about to graduate from high school. And, and that was kind of an accidental case too, because, but for the fact uh, that uh, Holiday had yep. uh, the video camera yep. and, and, uh, and was able to uh, shoot it at a time when most people didn't have video cameras. Uh, we, we didn't know things like cell phone cameras at that time. Uh, we wouldn't have known about Rodney King. And, and, and prior to that, you know, um, you know the, at least the white community really didn't understand uh, that there were things like uh, police beatings at that time. So have we really progressed uh, since 1992? I don't think so. You know, and I think that that is why we're at this moment uh, where, you know, we need to begin to rethink. I think that the concept of uh, being able to simply train police away from using excessive force has proven to fail. It does have an impact. I don't want to be completely, uh, you know, dismissive of the fact that good training is important. Uh, there has been some legislative attempt, but we continue to see uh, a, a culture in policing supported by current laws that allow the use of force, uh, especially deadly force in cases where it's not 
absolutely necessary. It's not the last resort. And I think until we legislate our way into having a system where deadly force may only be used when it's absolutely the last resort, uh, we're going to continue to have this problem. I, I, I find it interesting. You know, people used to talk about Florida when we're talking about stand your ground. And I said, well, you, I hope you understand that California has a similar law. And when it comes to policing, actually, police doesn't have, they don't have to retreat, right? And you have to look at their use of force it's still basically through the lens of what happened in the last few seconds of a, of a use of deadly force. Never mind that the actions of the officer may have prompted the event that then forced the, you know, the use of deadly force at the, at the very last moment. So there's still a lot of work that needs to, to be done. Now, what I do believe is different today than it was during the Rodney King incident is that I think that there is a, the level of awareness is reaching deeper into our community. I think there are people that probably feel comfortable with the way policing was going on that have been confronted with this horrendous video uh, with George Floyd that while no question that the Rodney King video was very graphic, I think that there are some qualitative difference, obviously, in the outcome of what occurred to, uh, to Mr. Floyd. And I think that there is an opportunity there, but I also see that opportunity can close very quickly if we as a community do not hold all of our public officials, including district attorneys and legislators accountable to make sure that this moment is really a parting of the waters from the old ways. So in your estimation, uh especially as a prosecutor, how, and, and actually I should mention uh, your former police chief too. Right. So um, how do we fix uh, policing? Look, I think first of all, we need, to, we need to reimagine what policing, what should the role of policing be? I think that we often call upon the police to do many things that should be done by other people. So whether you're talking about calls involving people that have, uh, you know, that are displaying potential symptoms of mental health problems, uh, whether you're talking about tra traffic enforcement. Um, you know, there are many other functions that we should be looking away from, from you know, sort of the uniform arm, uh, you know, person, if you will, to handle those calls. I think that we also need to create legislative uh, structures that demand that, that police use of force and especially deadly force can only be used when there is absolutely no other way to, to prevent the death or serious injury either of the officer or someone else. And that every moment leading up to the actual use of force plays a role in totality of the circumstances in that accountability process. Uh, the current laws do not do so. Uh, I think that finally, um, you know, we have to ensure that we deal with the issues of qualified immunity, which I know Congress is trying to do. While that only really applies to civil law, and for those of you who may not be familiar with the, the, the whole concept of qualified immunity without getting too complicated, basically it provides an umbrella for, for public officials, and, and in this case, police officers sometimes uh, from being sued uh, and being held liable civilly for cases of excessive force uh, under a set of circumstances that is very, very narrowly defined uh, for liability to occur. And what happens is that when an officer does use force inappropriately, first of all, it's a high bar to be able to hold the agency accountable or the governmental structure to be held accountable. Uh, but more importantly, the officer can never be held personally liable for this. I think that we have to create a, a mechanism that actually creates some civil liability because sometimes it's a risk of having, you know, sort of a stakes in the game, if you will, having skin in the game that also will modify behavior. So I think that you have to do several things. Number one, we have to uh, move away from having policing, you know, be the, the, the response to many things in our community, dealing with mental health and traffic and many other things that we can have other people that are unarmed and have a different type of training to deal with that. Number two, I think that we have to create uh, the thresholds uh, dividing what, whether deadly force is lawful or not have to be narrowly tailored to make sure that there is a less likelihood that, that, that deadly force will be lawful. And then finally, I think that we have to deal with qualified immunity so that you know, police officers understand that bad behavior can actually 
also provide a level of personal liability to them. And that will also help them modify behavior. And then um, as a prosecutor, uh, what do you think you can do uh, to uh, better hold police accountable? And I understand, you know, there are limitations in the law, but in California, we've now fixed that at least to some extent. Yeah, you know, and I, and I like to think, and by the way, I was the only law enforcement person in the state that supported not only the law that passed initially, but actually the more stringent law that we were trying to pass, which would have made it, uh, you know, basically forced would have to have been basically the last resort. That's not what we have today. Um, you know, if you talk to police lawyers, they would tell you and they're trained to police officers, nothing has changed. Uh, you talk to the ACLU and say, well, you have to give the most robust interpretation to the new law. And I, and I agree. And certainly we, we would do so, but it, it remains to be seen. But the things that we can do, for instance, in my office now, I'm actually in the process of creating a special prosecutor. It's bringing a, an outside lawyer. And actually, you would appreciate this, David, since you brought in Rodney King. He was a federal prosecutor that successfully prosecuted the, the Rodney King officers on the federal trial, if you will recall. They were tried on a civil case on the use of force and they were acquitted. And then the US Justice Department brought in a uh, civil rights uh, action against the officers. And there was a gentleman by the name of Lawrence Middleton who prosecuted that case for the federal government and, and got a conviction. Uh, he since left the US Justice Department years ago after being part of the, uh, the uh, Civil Rights Division for a period of time became a, a civil litigator on civil rights issues. And he has agreed to become a special prosecutor contracting out to look at some use of force cases that we have already identified that the previous administration deemed to be lawful. Uh, we've also created a community board that, that is composed of uh, members of families that uh, have been the recipients of police violence in the family, um, civil rights lawyers and other community members and the clinic of the UCI law school working together to review approximately 600 uses of force, uses of deadly force cases that go back to 2012. So they're doing a look back. And then in the look forward, uh, we're hoping to get sufficient resources to, to increase the size of the unit that investigates these cases and kind of shift the protocols of the way we do the work and at least provide a, a, a more honest review of these cases uh, and and but you know I think that eventually what we have to do is we have to get state legislation that would take this work and create allow the counties to create an independent body outside of the district attorney's office to look at this work and then I think that we still have to create a legislative vehicle to provide for that accountability that I think is still somewhat elusive. And then um, the last question I'll ask um, on this is, you know, how do you build trust in communities of color between the police and those communities? Look, I think first of all, in order to build trust, you, you have to, you have to repair the harm, right? You have to go back and, 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 you know, there's a lot of harm that has been caused and that has to be addressed. So for instance, one of the things we're doing, you know, there's an increase in violence happening all over the nation driven by a whole lot of things. I think the displacement of COVID, uh, I think that the extreme poverty, the, the lack of, uh, you know, the disenfranchisement of so many communities, and, and quite frankly, a, a crazy availability of guns in the streets, including increasingly more and more homemade guns that, you know, people come by the kids and put the guns together, and, and that's still very legal uh, by and large. Uh, has created a, a, a tremendous problem with violence. Well, typically the way law enforcement would deal with this is more cops, more prosecutors, more prison terms. We in LA have actually turned that conversation around. I actually disbanded our hardcore prosecution unit, which is, uh, you know, I consider a throwback from the eighties and nineties. And we have replaced it with uh, what we call our, our community violence reduction initiative. And what this is, is, is taking bringing community, bringing county public health together, bring in the police department and prosecutors, to working collectively and looking at violence through a lens of a public health problem. And then almost using a clinical approach that looks at prevention, intervention, and then when appropriate, obviously arrest and prosecution, but using that as a last resort. 
uh, I believe that that will begin to build some level of trust in those communities that are being played by violence, especially by them playing a central role in the solutions. But I think that we need to continue to ensure that where we can, that we have not only greater transparency, but greater input and participation of the community in determining how you create a healthy and a sustainably safe community. And community has to play a major role in that part. It cannot be up to the police and prosecutors and the government alone. And actually, I, I lied. I, I'm going to ask one more question. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, basically, you know, one of the problems that I have is this whole idea that it's just a few bad apples. But if you look at all of these police cases, it's not a few bad apples. It may be one person who's pulling the trigger, but it's 10 people that are watching that aren't uh, reporting it. How do you deal with that culture? Well, and, and that precisely that goes to the point that I tried to make earlier, that the only way you're going to adjust the, the, the culture of American policing is by, number one, reducing the role of policing. So you reduce the, the, the opportunities for, for people to encounter the police, one. Two, you create laws that very clearly create bumper guards around when you can use force. And then thirdly, that you create a vehicle for personal liability if you violate the law in using that force. I think that you know you can have training and you can you know create more diversity and recruitment, but that has proven to fail over and over again, right? We, uh, you know, after the Rodney King incident, if you recall, we we talked a great deal about training in the LAPD, and you know millions and millions of dollars were in, invested in training. Uh, if you look at the the makeup of the LAPD, it's a minority majority police department. Uh, that still hasn't necessarily addressed the issues of force, and I think the problem is that the, 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 the culture of policing is, is, is foundationally driven by the law and what the law allows police officers to do. And I think until we shift that, that basic foundational uh, structure, it, it really doesn't matter. You know, I tell people that it's not enough to have diversity in terms of color or in terms of gender, you have to have diversity of thought. And in order to develop diversity of thought, you have to create a vehicle to, to provide an opportunity for that to occur. Great, well, I wanna thank you for uh, coming out and uh, helping us uh, uh, with our, our fundraiser tonight and also sharing your thoughts on a uh, vital uh, topic uh, for those wondering, uh, George unfortunately has to leave early uh, because he has a, a, another commitment as well. Um, so uh, thank you for coming out. Uh, we're going to bring Brendan Woods in may, in a moment, but uh, first may, uh, we may have. I say, may I say oh, a quick sure. word, David? Yeah, you know, for those of you that are uh, that are participating today, uh, I want to put a plug in for the fundraiser because uh, I think it was said by some of the earlier speakers, uh, but the reality is that one of the main vehicles in order for a democracy to work is for transparency, is for unbiased and open information that is made available to the public. Government generally by itself is not going to hold itself accountable. Government holds you can only hold government accountable when the people are holding government accountable. And what the Vanguard does is to put this information out there, just lay it out there so that you can see what is going on, so that you can be a critical thinker and make your own judgment about whether things are working or not. And having independent journalism in this country today is so critically needed. We are at a time when major newspapers are shutting down or they're being bought by large corporations that control their editorial capacity where journalists are, are not necessarily getting access to information. And the work that goes on in the vanguard is the type of journalism is so necessary for a healthy democracy. And in this case, uh, for a healthy criminal legal system. So I just wanted to put that plug in there for you, David, and for the vanguard, it's very important. Well, thank you very much, George. My pleasure. Thank you. And you take care. You too. Bye-bye. All right. That was uh, LA District Attorney George Gascone. Um, we are now going to have uh, uh, some words from some of our great interns uh, in our internship program. 
Uh, we're going to start with uh, Roxana. Yeah, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I think I'm first going to talk a little bit about the internship and then share a key experience that I've had. So um, with the Vanguard internship, what the, inter the Vanguard does is we train students how to write articles for the Vanguard, and we do that in two ways. Uh, one way is through our court watch program, which you've heard a little bit about. And what interns do is we watch criminal court hearings and trials and we report on what we see. And the overall focus of that is to point out the injustices that occur within those courtrooms and um, to inform the public about what's happening. And uh, a second way is we receive assignments and we write articles reporting on various social issues and issues on the criminal legal system. Uh, for me, both programs were like learning experiences. Um, you know, I, I learned a lot about the court process and so many other important things that I didn't know much about before interning here. Um, I've had many wonderful and insightful experiences here, but um, a key experience for me has been, um, it began when, with the article that I co-wrote with Kaylin, who's also here today. And um, she's running the LA branch. But um, that article pointed out new evidence in the case of a man named Chief Stinkwitz. And he is a Native American and he's currently on death row at San Quentin. Uh, his case really impacted me and it pointed out a serious case of injustice and possible wrongful conviction. And being able to intern with the Vanguard gave me the opportunity to report on his case and actually do follow up articles um, I was also able to meet Chief's legal team, and um, I'm currently now working close with them to advocate for Chief. Um, before coming to the Vanguard, I was really unsure of what I wanted to do after graduating, which I'm going to be doing um, this semester at UC Berkeley. But uh, now I know that I do want to become a lawyer, and I want to become a criminal defense lawyer and also help those who are wrongfully convicted, like Chief. So um, I'm very grateful to have interned here and it really was a life-changing experience for me. Thank you, Kaylin. And now I'm going to introduce uh, Lynn and Julieta who head up our uh, Vanguard at UC Davis team. Hi, I'm Lynn. Um, I am co-editor in chief of the Davis Vanguard at UC Davis, where I oversee the city news desk and the social justice news desk. Um, the Davis Vanguard at UC Davis writes news for students by students. Um, one, I feel like I can't share just one key experience because it, everything has been a key experience from going to court and then doing the COVID-19 project and now this new endeavor. Um, the Vanguard has taught me a lot about myself as writing because I'm an aspiring journalist. Um, it's been a really key part for my foundation into journalism. So I have a lot, everyone who knows me knows this, but I have a lot of um, appreciation and pride for my work at the Vanguard. So um, yeah, I wanna thank David and Danny, who I don't know is here, and Michelle and all the friends that I've made. And it's a really good program. Thank you. Um, yeah, going off of what Lynn said, um, I'm Julieta. I'm the co-editor chief of the Davis Vanguard UC Davis alongside Lynn. And I oversee the campus and student opinion desk. Um, and I think I've gained a lot of valuable experience from the Davis Vanguard from going to court watch in person, to covering the pandemic in California's prisons. Um, I also have nothing but good things to say about the Vanguard and the opportunities it's given me. And also the students that, the student writers that I've been able to help at the Davis Vanguard UC Davis and seeing them grow as writers has been really rewarding. Um, and I think it offers a lot of amazing opportunities for people who either want to go into journalism like myself or who want to go into law, I think there's a lot you can learn from the Davis Vanguard and I really appreciate it. Thank you both Lynn and Julieta. Um, and uh, now uh, Kaylin uh, from our uh, UCLA program. 
Hi, I'm Kaylin. Um, I'm currently one of the editors in chief for the UCLA Vanguard branch. Um, well, it's more like the LA Vanguard branch because um, we have students from all over LA County, um, mostly UCLA, but we also have USC students. We have a couple of high school students and um, it's just been such a wonderful experience to um, start the LA branch. Um, we started in mid-January and we started with just a couple of fellow interns and I started as a court, court watch intern myself and now we have about 20 writers. Um, we do city news um, all across LA County um, and also so many of our student writers are just so grateful to be part of the club because it gives them a platform to talk about things that are important to them happening in their own hometowns in LA County and um, campus news. We have student opinion. Um, they write about things that are happening at UCLA and USC that are important to them. And it's just been really wonderful to get to meet all of the writers in LA County and um, see our Court Watch program start to um, expand with the help of Lauren. Um, we're trying to get into the LA court some more and um, do what they're doing up in Davis. And I'm just really grateful for this experience. It's helped me meet so many wonderful people um, and work with incredible writers like Roxana, who I got to work with in the um, project she talked about. And I'm just so grateful for this experience. And I'm grateful that I got to talk about how much it means to me. Well, thank you, Kaylin. Uh, and then finally, uh, Coda from our Berkeley program. Hi there, guys. Um, I'm a I'm a bit of a talker, so feel free to cut me off. Um, so first, I just want to say thank you so much for coming out tonight and supporting the Vanguard. This is amazing. Uh, my name is Coda Slingluff, and I've been interning here for a little over nine months. I'm also co-editor in chief of the Vanguard at Berkeley Branch. Uh, my goal is to become a public defender and advocate for the incarcerated. So currently, I'm a student at Berkeley majoring in philosophy which basically means that I talk way too much about old dead guys. So I'm gonna talk about one of my favorites. Uh, you may have heard of him, his name is Plato. Uh, and he called justice um, harmonious strength. So it's essentially something that is both individual and social and binds together the various pieces of a society to create a stable dependent state that every person can live within. Um, I mentioned this because I think people tend to agree with Plato. And um, our system of justice is foundational to the world we live in. And with justice being this strangely personal and social thing, I think it's especially important that we have an active hand in it. Uh, and for me and for many of our interns, I, the Vanguard is our way to participate in justice. So as an intern, I've been able to sit in on live court proceedings and write about what I observe. I've been able to take situations and convey them their gravity, their importance to a larger audience. This gives me the chance to not only formulate opinions and accumulate knowledge about our justice system, but to help others interact with it too. I really think there's nothing more rewarding than reading feedback on my articles, hearing people come to terms with realities of inequality in real time, uh, relief at cases that go well, and all sorts of opinions that are actively being molded by the information in front of them. Uh, and it's a reminder to me how justice really is harmonious strength. It's a process we all work through and we work through it best together. And the Vanguard literally makes it so we can work through it together. Um, it's been a really strange time in history. And I think my time with the Vanguard has reflected that. I got the opportunity to write on numerous events as they happen. Uh, one of those was the storming of the Capitol on January 6th. Uh, I wrote an article on that same night, uh, pointing out the differences between how Capitol writers rioters were treated and how Black Lives Matter protesters from the previous year had been treated. Um, the article accumulated almost 200 comments with lots of opinions and takes in the same night, all working in their own way towards making sense of what really felt senseless at the time. Um, and I was really stunned to think that my words could have any part in that history. Uh, but that's kind of what the Davis Vanguard does. It gives every one of us a chance to be heard when it comes to justice. And it gives us the ability to participate and connect with the systems that affect our lives. Uh, and then one just quick plug for our new branch at the Vanguard at Berkeley. Uh, we've been able to put together even more coverage of things that matter to the Bay Area. We've covered Berkeley campus news, discrimination cases, hate crimes, and many public policies that affect the community. 
we've just been getting started this semester, but I am so proud of my team of writers and so excited for what's to come. Uh, so none of that, none of what we do would be possible without the Davis Vanguard. So I guess what I'm trying to say is the Vanguard has helped me understand not just the legal system, but how I and how everybody really has a hand in justice. And I've been able to do a lot of good here, as have all of us. And I'm so grateful to be part of this program. And I'm so grateful that this exists. So thank you, guys. So um, I have a request uh, that all of the interns please turn on your cameras as somebody wants to get a screenshot of everybody. So um, I want to uh, say a couple words and then we'll bring uh, Brendan back in uh, to have the second part of our discussion. Uh, but uh, first of all, these five interns are just absolutely amazing uh, people. They're amazing interns, they're amazing writers. Uh, remember their names because in 10 years, you're gonna go, oh, I knew this person when. Um, do you wanna go up against CODA? Uh, if you're a prosecutor in 10 years, I don't think so. Um, so I, I, I'm just blown away by the quality of the young people that we have going through this program. And I think a lot of um, you know what we do gets noticed uh, but one thing that we do that I don't think gets enough notice is that we really provide opportunities for, for young people uh, through mentorship uh, to really develop and hone their skills. And I don't think, uh, I don't think we get enough credit for that. Um, and it's actually one of my favorite parts of doing all this, even though I love every aspect of the Vanguard, except for raising money for some reason. Uh, but, um, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Um, so, so thanks, guys, uh, for for coming out and and sharing your stories. I, I've been getting a lot of feedback, and uh, everybody is is just blown away by these stories. Um, so, uh, we're going to bring uh, Brendan back in uh, for an important uh, discussion on uh, uh, on policing. Um, so, you know, you're in Alameda County. Um, Oakland, uh, you know, Oscar Grant, um, I think happened right before you became a chief public defender. Um, but uh, what is what is it like uh, right now in Oakland dealing with police issues? I think it's probably the same way it is everywhere. Um, policing in America is built a certain way. It's based on the system of white supremacy and racism. So I, I think it's the same everywhere where police are still exerting their power in a way that oppresses black and brown people. You know, if we think about um, the verdict of Derek, the Derek Chauvin trial and George Floyd, and we wanna talk about, has there been any real change in policing since then? And I, and I really don't think there has been any change. I think policing was the same prior to the verdict. It was the same prior to the murder of George Floyd. It's the same after the murder of George Floyd. Um, there really has not been much change. Um, and, and if we just think about what happened during the trial, um, during the trial, we had uh, Adam Toledo was like murdered. He's a 13 year old kid right, right before the trial started. Uh, we had um, Dante Wright who was murdered during the trial. Um, at the same day of the verdict, we had Makia Bryant who was murdered by police. And, and as you know, just a few weeks ago here in Alameda County, we had the murder of Mario Gonzalez. So I can't say that policing has changed or there's been any real tangible outcome that we've seen from the murder of George Floyd. Yes, there have been more energy around policies to be put in place, but we pull back and think, has the culture of policing changed? Has police changed in their activity? Has the mindset of policing changed? And from what we heard from George earlier, no, it hasn't. And I think we see that every day, um, especially here in Oakland. And, and you probably see it more than most people because you guys are in the courtroom all the time on the front line and, and you're seeing these cases of people coming through, having had their rights violated, having been mistreated by police, um, and, and having illegal use of force. Absolutely. So I think when you think about policing, um, 
the stories our clients can tell about policing are the stories that people should be listening to. Uh, I, I, I was thinking about um, your organization and Court Watch and the inside lens that you guys have and have the um, ability to amplify is just really incredible because so much happens in the dark in court. Uh, so much happens that our community is just not aware of. So much happens that the public is not aware of. And if they could see everything or read these reports and see the lies that happened over and over again, I think people would be shocked. Uh, they have this concept, especially from the media and from TV shows that um, police are there to help and they are there to take care of communities. And there's this whole concept of community policing, but there's so much harm and violence and, and this destruction of communities that comes from policing that people aren't aware of. And I think our clients can tell that story in a really different light. I think your, your paper tells that story. Yeah, and uh, you know, I know there's a, a lot of public defenders in, in the audience today, but you know, one of the things that's really um, in, in interesting. Public defenders, I'm going to steal your interns. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that um, you know I've learned uh, attending court for the last 15 years is how bad policing actually is, and um, you know, every time I hear the story or the, the excuse, well, it's a few bad apples. I, I'm like, go sit in court for a few weeks and then tell me that. Because what you see are, um, and, and I remember, and I didn't want to embarrass uh, George, uh, but when we sat in court in San Francisco, we saw appalling stuff that nobody ever knew anything about. I mean, uh, people being roughed up by police and prosecutors continuing to seek uh, resisting arrest, felonies, uh, you know, PC-69s, um, uh, you know, in these cases where police were brutalizing people for no reason. And then you watch these police try, try to explain stuff and they, they try to, uh, lay foundation and they can't do it and they don't understand what the law is. And I'm not even a lawyer and I'm like going, dude, you don't even know the law. Um, it, it's, it, it's shocking. Don't get me going on this. Uh, but, yeah. but, you know, I, I think if people don't see this, then they think, oh, you know, it's just a few cases, you know, oh, a thousand cases every year, somebody gets killed, but, you know, they're having millions of encounters, but that's not reality. It's not reality, and I'm going to take a second. Um, I think that's one of the things that puts me maybe on guard or makes me worried or nervous about the um, verdict in the Chauvin case is that um, there's this probably, there's this collective feeling once Black people have, yes, finally we got justice. And I think there's a, a belief in society that it worked, you know, um, and it's going to end up giving people this false sense of hope. Um, it could lead people to believe that the system that is at, is actually working, and it is not. Uh, and I, I guess I fear that people will be complacent because of the outcome of this verdict and the movement that had so much energy, had so much action, had so much um, of a catalyst last year will not work or be as active this year. And th there's so much more work that we have to do as a society. And I, I think people might celebrate the conviction and they begin to give legitimacy to the system. And it's a system that, as we know, or hopefully people know, will continue to hunt, prosecute, cage, and murder Black people and people of color unless we are on it nonstop. Um, sure, they may have gotten the prosecution right in this case, but there are millions of Black and Brown people who are suffering at the hands of police and prosecutors and probation every single day. And so we can't just think that everything is rosy and working because of one verdict. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between the Chauvin uh, conviction and then what happened uh, with, uh, what, is it Meserly um, in uh, the Oscar Grant um, trial? <laughs> so you wanna hear my complete cynical answer? Um, they had the other conviction in Chauvin or the nation would have burned down. I mean, I mean that, that is almost a cynical answer. They had to get a conviction here um, because the world would have burned down. And I think maybe more technically, legally, 
from a standpoint of watching um, both cases, the actions by Chauvin are completely unjustified. Um, there, there's no justification. I, I think in measurely um, not justified, but an argument for justification, you could say. But in this case, there's no justification. There's none. None. I mean, there's so much time to contemplate, think, and realize that your action is going to end up killing someone. Um, so th that's probably, those are the biggest differences. And I, I think at the time of 2020, when we, where we were as a nation during COVID, everyone paying attention with nothing, almost nothing better to do. It was just the right time. Um, it was kind of an explosion around racial justice and racial awakening, racial awareness uh, that happened. Um, you have to wonder what would have occurred or would it have happened the same way if COVID wasn't happening at the exact same time? And um, the cynic in me wonders and thinks maybe not. Because this, this is not the first black person we've seen murdered by police. Um, there have been so many more that arguably have been more egregious caught on tape. Um, in, you know, you mentioned Rodney King and, and I, I was in college at the time and I, and I remember seeing that video going, oh my God. I mean, we, black people notice it's happening every day. We, we're aware of it, but seeing it on video, thinking, okay, this is going to change shit. This will really change shit. And as we know, almost nothing has changed. Um, and I also wanted uh, kind of your thoughts on the Mario Gonzalez, because that seems to point exactly to the point that nothing's changed, because here we are post Floyd and the same thing happens. Yeah, and, and not just the same thing, but arguably something that is extremely or very close identical um, to the actions that has occurred, that occurred in Floyd. So police policing, their first response to a person of color is force and violence. And, and it happens over and over again repeatedly. And you know, when George was talking about solutions, I, I think one solution that has to be done, there's so many, so many that has to be done, but um training that goes beyond implicit bias, but goes into the realm of being anti-racist and making sure that you're hiring people who don't have that sort of ill will towards people of color. That's a hard thing. I think there's policing attracts a certain type of people. And if we don't get to that, I, I don't think there's anything um, that can be done to really change the culture of policing. And, and there's gotta be a recognition of police officers, how policing started, that it, that it comes from slavery, that it comes from slave patrols. And they've got to realize that their, their um, profession as it was originally created is inherently flawed. My uh, board is asking me to ask you uh, your thoughts on Chauvin's appeal and whether it has any merit. <laughs> Um, I'm not an appellate counsel. Um, God, it's so weird being on the um, other side in a way. So, because <laughs> I'm a defense attorney, um, I, I defend and, and you know, I, I could have, yeah. So um, I think the appeal and part of the basis is offensive because um, that's something we've been fighting very hard with regards to Black people being on juries and being able to be a, what I'm going to say, a complete Black person who's able to serve on a jury. So it is normal for Black people to have certain views about police officers. I mean, historically, we should not trust police, and you should be allowed to as a juror. You should be allowed to protest and participate in the Black Lives Matter rally and still be a juror in this case. That should have no bearing whatsoever. So... Um, do I think it has life? I want to say no, but it's weird to be arguing against an appeal as a defense attorney. <laughs> I hear you. Um, so do you have any thoughts on how we solve this police problem? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I've been tweeting a lot, this cannot be reformed. And I actually believe that. 
uh, I think it needs to be torn down and rebuilt. But if we're going to work within the confines that we have, there, there's some real, I don't want to say easy, but fairly easy things we can do. Um, the police unions don't want them to be done. And maybe they're not that easy, but they, they should be done. We should have the will to implement them based on the number of black and brown bodies that keep getting killed by police. Uh, one easy uh, decertification process, right? I mean, California has failed to put that in place. I think 45 other states have a decertification process in place. So California needs one. I think SB2 is, um, covers that this year, but that's one thing that has to be done. Um, civilian review boards uh, with power um, power to fire officers and to investigate properly and to be funded properly. Um, that's another one that seems to be easy that should be done. Uh, one that's maybe more controversial is not having police officers be armed, you know, get no guns. You know, there are like, what is it, 20 or 19 countries that have police forces that don't have guns. Why can't we do the same thing in the United States? Um, what else? Obvious, defund, right? If we're saying defund, defund police and fund community. There are different ways with regards to how police money can be spent and how police should be responding um, to events. You know, you shouldn't be responding to a mental health event. You shouldn't be um, have police respond to traffic incidents. Um, there, there's different ways to handle that. Um, one thing George mentioned was qualified immunity. That's another thing. Uh, so I, I could probably, yeah, I, I've got, I got, I got thoughts. <laughs> I've got ideas. I know we're getting close on time, but there, there's so much that can be done. Um, Talk about uh, qualified immunity. Why has that become such a big uh, uh, point of emphasis? I, I think it has to be because, um, so if we think about what have police responded to, it seems like nothing. Um, they haven't responded to fear of conviction. They might respond, they're gonna use it, lose their livelihood, right? I mean, that might change it. If you say, you know, you're going to be bankrupt, you're going to, all your money's gonna be taken, you can't afford to pay your kids and send them to college or whatever, that could change it. Um, cause nothing else seems to have worked. All right. Well, um, some closing thoughts. Um, yeah, just briefly, uh, I want to say this. Thank you for having me on. I, I love talking about this. Um, I, I think the people who were on, um, who are watching are active, um, they're activists and they care about this system and, and I hope they continue to care, continue to fight and continue to work to get us to a place where you know, ju there is justice, where there isn't a sort of system that is inherently racist, um, that really ends up harming black and brown communities. So um, thank you for the work you're doing, David. Thank you to your interns. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you, Brendan. Yeah, it's interesting, full circle. I got into this whole space over a proposal by my wife uh, for a civilian review board in Davis. And uh, because she did that, they shut down the Human Relations Commission. Um, this was in 2006. Um, so I do feel like there's been a little bit of progress. Um, not as much as I'd like to see, but a little bit. Um, so, yeah. Um, when, we, when we think about reform, I don't want people to just focus on police um, because it really is the entire system that needs reforming from police to prosecution, to judges, to jails, to prisons, to sheriffs. The way we do this criminal punishment system is completely flawed. So a broader perspective in ways and how we can fix or try to repair this thing. All right. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate you taking time out from your very busy schedule uh, to uh, share your thoughts on this. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, that is our program. I want to make uh, one last pitch for those of you still uh, in our audience. Uh, become a sustaining member. $10 a month, not a lot of money, but it makes a big difference to us. Uh, so if you can log on and do that, uh, it'd be a big help for us. Um, and then thank you everybody for coming out uh, tonight and for donating and, and supporting the work of the Vanguard.